Good morning. It is good to be back with you this morning at Dolphin Way Baptist Church. Scheduled to be here a few weeks ago, but while I was at the Southern Baptist Convention, I got sick. And it's not from what happened at the Southern Baptist Convention other than I called some kind of bug and you did not want me here that Sunday morning. I can say it that, like that. But it is good to be back with you. This morning I want to do something that we, uh, we actually started doing when I was the interim here. I did it a couple of times when I was serving as senior pastor here, and I wanted to do it um, as as a guest preacher coming back. And that's just talking about where we are in our culture, where we are as the church. Uh, And I began calling this the State of the Union. Uh, and so we will stick with that because we kind of we kind of get a sense and understand what that means, right? It's us talking about what things are like, how things are, how things are going. So we're going to look at our culture. We're going to look at the church. We're going to look at some stats. I don't want to overwhelm or bombard you with stats, but I want to give you uh, I want to give you the reasons, the facts, and then we'll we'll make some conclusions. Uh, based on those facts. And then we're going to look at scripture and see what God has called us to do in light of what's going on around us uh, and who God has called us to be. There are two passages I want to direct our attention to this morning, two passages that God has called me uh, back to in the sense of not only my walk with him, but also uh, my journey now at New Orleans Seminary and what he's called me to do over there. Uh, but also passages that I believe we need to return to regularly, regularly. The first one uh, is a passage that even if you're not in church, it's a passage with which you can be familiar. Meaning if you didn't grow up in church and uh, you've never heard a sermon in your life, you will get the reference uh, and you will also understand the illustrations. It will make sense to you and that's why Jesus used it. But it's something to which we need to return regularly. So we're going to ask the question, who are we? What's going on uh, in our culture? Uh, What's going on in our church? Uh, And then we're going to give some responses. I want you to see what has happened culturally to get us where we are. And then I want you to see how we can actually use that model in the way that God has called us to use it to change the culture. Because that's what God has called us to do. And again, we'll look at that passage. I want us to begin with a word of prayer. And I want us to prayerfully talk about these things, to consider these things. Some of these are going to stretch you, but I I say some of these terms. I want to give you some of these concepts because this is where we are right now in our country. I believe this without a shadow of a doubt, uh, that we are as divided as any other time in our nation's history. Now, we would immediately go to the Civil War, wouldn't we? We say, well, Blake, we're not at war. I submit to you that we are. I grew up in the 80s, 1988, the Berlin Wall fell, but uh, I was eight years old when the Berlin Wall fell, and as I was growing up, I knew that we were at war, but it was a different kind of war, wasn't it? It was called a cold war, not hot war. What's the difference? Well, in the hot war, bullets were being thrown at one another. Missiles are being launched. Someone said this, and I thought, that is a great way to consider this. We are in a cultural cold war right now. Make no mistake about it. It is a cold war. And we're going to dive into that. We're going to unpack that. But we are so busy looking at the 10% of the, of the iceberg that we're missing the 90% of the iceberg. What's really going on in our culture, what's really happening Now, this should wake us up as the church to remember what God has called us to do because we cannot fix the problem through political means because the problem is not political. We can't fix the problem through any other means other than Jesus Christ. That is the problem. Understand that. That is the issue. And it just so happens that we are a part of the solution. The problem is we ain't solving the problems. That's the problem. We're not living as the solutions. We're just adding to the problems. So let's pray. Let's dive in. 
Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for this day. God, I pray in Jesus' name that you would give us ears to hear what your spirit says to Dolphin Way Baptist Church. Lord, I pray that you would help us to see exactly where we are culturally, exactly where we are as the church, and God, remind us of the call on our life and the response that you've already given to us in your word. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that we would recognize the urgency of the moment. And I pray that we would respond. We surrender to you, Lord. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. As a nation, ever since the beginning, and by beginning, I mean our forefathers, Adams and Jefferson argued about the role of the government. It actually severed their friendship for about 13 years. They didn't even talk to one another. Why? Because they were arguing over the role, over the scope of the federal, of the national government, and connected to that, the state government. Our nation was birthed with arguments over politics. That is nothing new brothers and sisters. I think we need to understand that because we just automatically assume, well, we've never been so divided politically. That's not true. That's not true. We have been more divided politically. And again, that reminds us that politics is not our issue. It goes much deeper than that. Our arguments the divisions that are happening right now in our culture are core arguments. They are core issues. When we think about culturally where we are, understand that right now in our culture, when I say our culture, what I'm talking about is particularly the West, specifically the United States. Why am I talking about this culture? Well, because that's where you live. That's where you raise your families and go to work. So of course I'm going to talk about where you live. So we're going to focus in on that because if God has called you to live right here, right now, he's called you to live in this nation, in this culture, and to be a Christian in the midst of this culture. Well, how do you do that? It helps to understand where we are as a culture. So in this moment, we are arguing not just over again. There's the 10% that we all focus on and that Fox News and CNN get us to focus on. Then there's the 90% of the iceberg that is submerged. We're arguing over the existence and the place of truth. You recognize that's not a political problem. That's a spiritual problem. We are arguing over whether or not truth exists. And if it does, what is the place and the role of truth in the midst of our culture? That goes so much deeper than a D or an R beside whomever's name. We're arguing over the very nature and, and the existence of right or wrong. If there is such a thing, we are arguing over the nature of reality biology and will we recognize biology or fabricate reality in our own minds in our own souls and in the culture at large we are arguing over truth morality and reality brothers and sisters it does not get more core and foundational than that and we're so busy arguing over the 10 percent of the iceberg we're so busy arguing over politics that we're not being who God has called us to be, doing what God has called us to do. It's one thing to argue over the editorial pages of a newspaper. It's always been the case. It's quite another thing to argue over the news itself. It's one thing to debate the opinions that people have. It's quite another thing to debate facts and do facts even exist? You think about our debates, each person is bringing not just their own opinion, they're bringing their own quote unquote facts. That's where we are. We're talking about my truth and your truth rather than the truth. We are debating the existence of morality beyond feelings. 
Now we're going to return to that because that's a very important point in this cultural moment. So I want to give you some, some words and we're going to move through this quickly, but I just want you to see where we are culturally and help us to make some conclusions. Okay. These are the cultural issues surrounding us today. The first is postmodernism. Postmodernism in a nutshell is the rejection of a meta narrative. You go, whoo, Blake, I'm going back to seminary using all these fancy words. Meta means great. Narrative means story. This is, this is what this means. There is a larger story into which we fit. You fit into the larger story of your family. Your family fits into the larger story of the culture around you. The culture right now fits into the larger story of all of the cultures that have ever existed. And all of those fit into the larger story of God and his activity in humankind. Postmodernism says there is no larger story. You're the story. You understand what that means for Christianity? What that means is we just dismiss 66 books of the Bible that help us understand God's activity in humankind. We reject it outright. We don't want to listen to God's story and we don't want to understand our part in his story. This has serious consequences for Christianity. Your news media on all sides rejects the meta narrative. They want nothing to do with God. They want nothing to do with his story and they certainly don't want to include our story in the larger story. It's a rejection of truth beyond oneself, meaning you determine truth, not something outside of you or for us, someone outside of us. There's also the element of what is called deconstructionism. This is a tenet of postmodernism. It's been around since the 1700s. What this means is there's a distrust and a dismantling of authorities and systems. The idea with postmodernism is if someone has power, you can't trust them. If there is a system in place, it's because someone has power and they erected that system so that they can control you with that power. Therefore, we need to dismantle all institutions. We need to dismantle all structures and all systems. There is a movement right now within the evangelical church to deconstruct the church. Why? Because they bought postmodernism, hook, line, and sinker. Make no mistake, it's not because of the inconsistencies or hypocrisy within the church. That's what they'll claim, but it's because they have bought the lie of postmodernism. They have bought the cultural deception. And finally, the God of postmodernism is tolerance. You must tolerate someone else. Now, of course, that has limitations because you can't tolerate a Christian who actually believes and lives out their Christianity. But you can tolerate everything else. All right, we move through that quickly to relativism. That comes on the heels of postmodernism. Just hang with me just a moment. Wade through this with me. For the relativist truth does not exist, and even if it did, it would not be knowable. Why is this important, and how do we see this? There is no true morality. There is only feelings. What do I mean by that? So the person who is a relativist doesn't ask, is this right or wrong? They ask, how do I feel about this? Just look around culturally. The question is not, is this right or is it wrong? The question is, how do I feel about this? How do you feel about this? It's emotion-centered. It's not truth-centered. It's emotion-centered. This moves into nihilism. Nihilism is the idea that nothing has meaning or value. Culturally, if you understand or recognize the show Seinfeld, the tagline of the show Seinfeld is it is a show about nothing. It was a show that demonstrated, it illustrated nihilism. There is no larger story weaving it together. There's simply characters responding to the situation of the day. That becomes the show. It's a show about nothing. To the nihilist, nihilist, life is a show about nothing. There is no meaning. There is no value. If you wonder why the suicide rate is skyrocketing, it's because our young people are growing up nihilists. Because they've been influenced by postmodernism. They've torn down everything around them and they go looking around and saying, well, nothing has meaning and nothing has value because y'all torn it all down. It's the natural result of deconstructionism. 
To the nihilist, there is no beauty. There is no ultimate good. Nothing in life is valuable or meaningful or beautiful. Even humans. We then move into emotionalism. We are in a society where virtue is tied to emotion. Virtue is tied to emotion. It's not tied to truth. It's tied to emotion. Who do we listen to? It's the person who emotes the loudest or the person who emotes the most. That's the person to whom we listen to. The one who is the most emotional is the one who is most virtuous in our society. That means someone who is not doing anything to change the culture around them or to do anything for humans can post a flag on their social media site and let everyone know how virtuous they are, even though they're not living any life of consequence or value or meaning or purpose. But they've emoted for all to see, so we recognize them as virtuous. And then we move into the final element of that that shows us where we are as a culture, and that is secularism. Secularism is the idea that our identity, worth, purpose, our mission is found not in the sacred but in the secular. It doesn't come from God, it comes from the world. Now, I want you to hear me. I want you to hear me well. The reason that I saved this for last is because this is not a problem of those people out there. This is a problem of us people in here. Make no mistake about it. We are secularists. What do I mean by that? Hang with me just a second. I want to give you some facts to support my proposition. What I'm saying to you this morning is that our issues as a culture are deep-seated. They are foundational. They are core issues. We are a secular nation. That's tough to say, especially on a day like today where we celebrate our nation's independence. Let me, let, let me tell you what I mean by that when I say I celebrate our nation's independence. I've been to almost every continent in the world. The fact that I woke up this morning in the United States of America means that I woke up in the best place to live in the world. One of the problems that we have as a nation is that we are not grateful. That we've forgotten just how blessed we are. That we're so comfortable in this freedom, that we're so comfortable in what God has blessed us with that we don't even appreciate it. Do we have problems? Well, of course we do. We have people. Any group that consists of people will be a group that consists of problems. But I can tell you this, there ain't no other country in the world that has people trying to jump over walls and swim through rivers to get to it like ours does. And you have to ask a question, why are these people doing that? The past month, I've met with, with students who are wanting scholarships to come to seminary. And I've met with students from Cuba. I've met with students from Venezuela. I've met with students from all over the world. And there ain't no group of people who's more grateful for this nation than people from other nations who get to live here. And we don't even realize it, do we? We don't even appreciate what God has blessed us with. This is an incredible nation. Why? Because it was built on Christian principles. It was built on Christian ideals. It was built on Christian values. We were founded on Christian values and Western ideals, but we are abandoning these values and ideals. No longer is Christianity the foundation for explaining the world around us. No longer is Christianity molding the moral structure for our society. Christian truth claims have lost authority. Our values are not tethered to biblical values anymore. What's driving us? I submit two things are driving us. Practically speaking, we've seen the sort of philosophical driving forces, but practically what's driving us is money and comfort. That's what's driving us. That's why we're so apathetic because we have more money and more comfort than any group of people in the history of the world. That's why we can get on social media and signal that we are virtuous and not do anything in our life of virtue and people will go, look how virtuous this person is. They talk, not to anybody, but through this machine. 
In the history of the world, the people who were virtuous were people who lived each and every day with virtue. And the people around them recognized their virtue because of what they did, not what they said. What's driving us? Money and comfort. We run to the things that add money and we run away from the things that subtract comfort. That is our motto for life. We will run to the things that add money and comfort. We will run away from the things that subtract from money and comfort. And we're raising our children and our grandchildren with this. And we wonder why they're looking around and seeing a life of no purpose and no value. To be quite honest with you, brothers and sisters, listen to me. It's because they've seen an entire few generations of people who have run toward money and run toward comfort. And yet these people are miserable. And they say, wait, you're, you're telling me to run in this direction towards money and comfort and you're telling me that I should build my life around this. That's what you did and you're miserable. So that's the state of the culture. Now the state of the church. We're going to move through this quickly. Hang with me. Based on Lifeway Research, based on ARDA, A-R-D-A. I'm going to give you some stats. I want to throw these out here. Just hang with me. Right now, our churches, the religious makeup of the U.S., we're a quarter evangelical, 21% Catholic. Why did I include all of these? I want you to see the third. More than mainline Protestants, which are some Presbyterians, Episcopalians, Anglicans, you can throw in a lot of, group of, a lot of groups, Methodists in mainline Protestant. Nothings represent more of our population than all of the mainline Protestant denominations combined. That is startling, brothers and sisters. We continue, church size, church attendance in the United States, 88% of our churches are less than 250 in worship. Only 2% of our churches have more than 1,000. 23% of people attend weekly, 19% monthly. This means that close to 60% of the U.S. population never attends church. So where are they getting their worldviews? Where are they getting their belief systems? This is, not even, this is not even factoring in what the churches that people are attending preach, what they're preaching. This is just saying 60%. They aren't even going to the Christian well to draw water. We keep moving here. Before we get to the state of evangelism, I just want to briefly mention the state of the SBC. I don't have these numbers on here, but just listen to them. Since 2020, this is COVID. Worship attendance in Southern Baptist churches has declined 19%. In two years, worship attendance has declined 19%. Now let's put, it, let's put faces on that. This means that in the past two years, a million people, who were attending are no longer attending. Bible studies, it's even worse. It's declined 22%. Bible studies in Sunday schools, that's a million and a half people missing in two years because of COVID. There are probably some people coming to your mind right now. Southern Baptist churches are declining. We're losing more churches than we're starting. We're making less of an impact on the world around us. And we're buying the lie the mainline denominations bought. If someone were to ask me what's going on in the SBC, this, is, this would be my answer. I've been thinking about how do I, how do I put this in, in terms? A couple of years ago, you could hear on the convention floor this statement over and over again, the world is watching, the world is watching. And so we began to make decisions based on what the world perceptions of us were. Now what happens when you begin to focus on the world? You know, well, you stop focusing on something else, right? The issue is not whether or not the world is watching. Because when we were walking through James, if you remember James chapter 4, verse 4, it said that friendship with the world is hatred towards God. We're never going to make friends with the world. I don't think we understand that. We are ne the world will never understand a Bible-believing, Bible-practicing Christian. They will never fathom that. 
They will never understand it. They will always say they all are crazy. They've been saying it for 2,000 years. But we've gotten in our head that we should focus on the world and be friends with the world. So when we say the world is watching, what we're also saying but not really saying is, yes, God is watching, but would rather keep our eyes on the world than on God. Would rather be friends with the world or friendly towards the world. That's the problem. It's the problem we've seen in all other denominations. Now keep that in mind because when we circle back to what we need to do and who we need to be, there's a reminder in that for us as Southern Baptists. Spiritual engagement. These are U.S. Protestant churchgoers. Again, I don't have these stats up here, but just factor these in. Three of ten church-going Protestants read their Bible daily. Significantly less than that weekly. What this means is, if you look at the stats, the vast majority of churchgoers only engage their Bible when they are at church. The only time, the vast majority of people who actually go to church, so we're talking about 40% of the population at this point, and within that 40%, the vast majority of them, the only time they engage scripture is while they're at church. Between the ages of 18 to 22, 66% of that age group stops attending church for at least a year. Why? Keep that in mind because we're going to circle back to that. We have to rethink our entire approach to who we are as Christians and who we are as the church. Now we get to evangelism. I want to give you some quotes here. John Sorensen is the, uh, he's the president, CEO of Evangelism Explosion. He said this, now perhaps more than ever, people are open to conversations about faith. This is a post-COVID world. Yet few Christians actually take the opportunity to engage in personal evangelism. 60% of the religiously unaffiliated, these are the nuns, N-O-N-E-S. They have nothing to do with religion. 60% of these people say they're very curious about others' faith. When you break down their statements, they say, yeah, I wonder why people would be committed to that. I wonder why people go to church. I wonder why people pray. I wonder why. They're very curious. So they're open to hearing about it. Scott McConnell, the president of Lifeway Research, said this. The study that they've done reveals that most Americans are open to talking about faith. It really isn't even about religious liberty. People not wanting to hear. It's not about religion being off limits. The reason conversations are not happening about the Christian faith is that Christians are not bringing it up. Look at that last line again. The reason conversations are not happening about the Christian faith is because Christians are not bringing it up. I don't want to hear us talking about the culture, the culture, the culture. Our problem is not the culture outside of the church. Our problem is the culture inside of the church. It's because our practice or lack thereof of our Christian principles, ideals, and beliefs. It's because statistics would tell us that the vast majority of people in our churches will stand before God one day never having shared the message and hope of Jesus Christ with a lost person. The church is declining. Why and whose fault is it? It's our fault. It's because of us. Christians in America are not living as Christians. It's as simple as that. So what do we do? Well, I'm glad you asked. Two passages of scripture I want us to pop in, make some application, pop into another one, make some application, and then wrap things up. Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 16. This is a passage you know. This is what we've looked at as a church. It's been years, but it's a passage that we all know. Verse 13 of Matthew chapter 5. These are the red letters. This is Jesus. You are the salt of the earth. Verse 14 says, you are the light of the world. Understand, he doesn't say you should be, you might be, you could be. He says you are. You're the salt of the earth. You're the light of the world. 
Now, these are illustrations. Even if you've never heard this reference, which I'm sure that you have, even if you didn't grow up in church, but even if you've never heard this reference, you get the illustration. That's kind of the point. Salt has numerous effects. That's why we use it as a preservative. It's also a diuretic. It's also a fertilizer. It can be, be used for all kinds of things, but this is what we know about salt. Salt changes whatever it comes into contact with simply by its nature. You put salt on something, that thing is now different than it was. You can try and scrape the salt off. You can try and wash it off, but you know, salt has touched it. It is different. So what's the picture here, brothers and sisters? Simply by our existence as Christians in culture, we should be changing the people, the communities, the structures, the organizations around us simply by being Christians in that context. Just because of who we are. Okay? Can we all agree that we're not doing a very effective job of that? Well, Jesus says, if you want to know why you might not be effective at this, he says, as he, as he keeps talking here, if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? Now, salt is a compound that it cannot lose its saltiness. Back in the ancient world, we're talking 2,000 years ago, they would take salt, sodium chloride, they would take this salt that would be extracted from the ocean or mined from the land. They would take salt and they would mix other elements into the salt. And when it would be hot, these other elements would leach out of the salt. So the picture that Jesus is painting for us is the problem with salt comes when you mix other things into the nature of what salt is. And then you apply that, but it's lost its very nature. It's lost who it is. We as the church have lost who we are. So when we go into the workplace and the grocery store and we go into our hobbies and all of the activities that we go into, people are not changed because we're not different. So what do you mean, Blake? Let me give you two ways. You know, those who've been here, you know where I'm going with this. Show me your calendar. Show me where you spend your money. And you show me your God. Show me your calendar. Show me where you spend your money. And you show me your idol. The reality is most of the people in our churches don't spend their money or their time any differently than people who don't come to church. Our lives are no different. Jesus goes on, right? Verse 14, you are the light of the world. Now, light is, is interesting because light is an object of sight, meaning you can see light but it's also a medium through which you see. So you can see a light, but you also use light to see other things. We all understand that. We all understand the quality of light. Jesus says, you're the light in the midst of the darkness. Darkness is all around you. And we're looking saying, oh, it's dark all around us. The darkness is enveloping us. And Jesus says, well, well yeah, this is why I spoke to this 2,000 years ago. It's because you're covering up your light. Again, brothers and sisters, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, if you've put your faith in Jesus and Jesus alone, you're no longer trusting in yourself, you've turned from your sins to Christ, he is the hope of your salvation right now and in eternity. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you are the light. The problem is we are not living ablaze with passion for God. Therefore, our light is hidden under a basket. It's not that we're not the light. It's that we're not shining as the light. And Jesus reminds us of this and calls us back to this. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Do, do, you, do you understand that statement? Jesus doesn't say, if you live a lit up life, it's going to make no difference. He says, if you live a lit up life, everyone is going to recognize it and notice it and want what you have. In verse 16, he says, in the same way, let your light shine before men, before other people, 
that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Live in such a way that people recognize it and they automatically, like Joseph in the Old Testament, where they said, there's nothing we can do to trap this guy other than his faithfulness to his God. That's it. That's all we've got on Joseph, that he's so faithful to his God. Oh, that the church of Jesus Christ would be that faithful to God, that the only thing people can make as an indictment against us is that we're so faithful to God. Be salt and be light. Now, I want us to, to transition to a sense of application. I want you to see this, this application point. We're going to illustrate it with a, with a cultural issue that's been in the news. We're going to make application, and then we're going to move to a close. There are three major paths to cultural shifts. The first step is to tolerate something. To tolerate means to allow, to put up with something without prohibiting or hindering. We do this with our kids, don't we? There's a, there's a behavior that we know if they keep going down this road, it's not going to end well, but we tolerate it. We begin to tolerate. So we have begun as a culture to tolerate things culturally. Then you move from tolerating to celebrating you celebrate something by praising it or commemorating that thing. You celebrate something when you recognize it and you set it aside as that which is good and that which is beneficial. So you've moved from allowing it without hindering it to now setting it aside and saying, this is good and this is beneficial. The next step is obvious. That is to propagate that thing, which means to reproduce and to spread. So we tolerate a thing, then we celebrate a thing, then we propagate that thing, which means we spread it. This is what's happening in our culture. For too long, the church allowed, tolerated, without hindering sins. We didn't have a cultural effect. The culture has always been about tolerating and celebrating and propagating things that are against God. They have always been about that. Why? Well, because their, their father is, is the father of lies. Their leader is the deceiver. He is the lion who's seeking to devour. Make no mistake about it. When Jesus says, you are the salt, you are the light, it's very specific. It is very exclusive. He's saying, you as followers of Jesus, not those other people. There are two kinds of people that exist in this world right now. Those who are in Christ and those who are not in Christ. Those who are in Christ have Jesus as Lord and Savior, leader and king. Those who don't have the devil as their leader and their king. So culture allows, celebrates, and spreads, and they've spread it into the church to where we've become okay with it. Last Friday, I called Pastor Keith, and I said, brother, not this past Friday, Friday before that, I said, brother, I need to celebrate with somebody. It was the overturning of Roe v. Wade. Why did I need to celebrate with someone? Because, man, we've worked, we've labored, we've gone to battle over this issue. It is a serious and critical issue. And praise God, we see some light in that issue. Praise God. I had to, I had to mow some grass that afternoon, and I was just... I was just flooding my mind and I was crying, mowing grass, crying. I go home, I called my kids together and I said, I need to talk to y'all. And I began crying and I wanted them to see me tearing up because I said, this is a huge moment. Never in my life have they said we could fight the battle. They've said the war is over. Now we get to fight the battle. The war is up in the air now, you see. We get to fight the battle. We've never been allowed to fight this battle before against abortion. Now we can fight, praise God. I'm excited about that. Up until now, up until that Friday, the war has been over. It's been called off. Now we get to fight. And then I start looking around and I see, see Christians 
who are telling me not to celebrate that and who are telling me to fight in a different way. And you, you understand it's because what is tolerated is celebrated and it went from safe, legal, and rare to shout your abortion. And then they, they fed the church this and the church bought it. Understand what we're talking about. Let's be very clear what we mean when we're talking about abortion. You understand that 86%, I'm going to throw out some facts, we're going to make some observations, then we're going to move through. Just hang with me. I'm feeling particularly passionate this morning. I'm going to try not to keep us all day. I'm going to try to wind this up pretty quickly. Listen to me. 86% of all abortions happen with unmarried women. You don't see that stat out there, do you? Why not? Do you know what that means? That means if we're talking about abortions, we can only say 14%, 14% even have the possibility of, of coming about because of a relationship that has happened with God's ideal, which is one man, one woman in a committed married relationship for their life and now they're having children. It's only the possibility of 14% of all of those cases. And we can begin to toss out some more of those numbers because that doesn't even factor in the fact that the woman might be pregnant with someone who's not her husband. That would, we would understand that that would be a significant reason for a married woman to have an abortion, wouldn't we? We could understand that. I'm not saying it's right, but I'm saying that we can then begin tossing out even the possibility of that pregnancy, that baby being being conceived in the context of a relationship that is God's ideal. What do we mean by that? We mean when we're talking about abortion, we're talking about that which is begun with sin. You say, well, what about rape and incest? Well, we would all agree that rape and incest are sins. Meaning someone has sinned to bring about this pregnancy. In the U.S., about half of all pregnancies are unintended. 21% of all pregnancies end in abortion. Less than 1% of abortions are because of rape or incest. The life of the mother, essentially, statistically, listen to me, statistically is a non-factor. I encourage you, talk to OBGYNs and ask them if the life of the mother is really an issue. I've had conversations with OBGYNs they will tell you it's a non-factor. So what are we talking about? Let's be real clear about what we're talking about here. We are talking about a woman who has conceived a baby unintentionally outside of God's design. We would call that sin. That's what that is. That is sin. Now, she then intentionally ends the life of the human being that is the natural and, by the way, well-documented consequence of a physical relationship between a man and a woman. It's not like we're surprised that these things happen. Now, we know that the intentional ending of a human life is wrong. Since abortion is the intentional ending of a human life, abortion is wrong. So what about the argument of rape or incest? Let's go there. Let's have that argument. Okay. Okay. We as believers particularly reject retribution in place of forgiveness, don't we? We're all about justice and justice should be handed out on the rapist. But we are not about retribution. We are about forgiveness. Abortion is retribution on the innocent result of someone's sin. A woman is horribly violated. And we encourage that person who has been violated now to violate someone else, someone who's innocent. It would be like people encouraging right now Ukraine to go and attack Kenya because Russia attacked Ukraine. That's what we're doing. This is a dishonest debate. And we have imbibed this in our churches. Why? Because the prettiest, wealthiest, most popular, and largest platform people are constantly telling us abortion is okay, abortion is okay, abortion is okay, abortion is okay. And we as the church are not looking at God saying, I'm not focusing on the pretty, popular, wealthy people. I'm focusing on God. What does God have to say about this? Listen to me. God is very clear on sin. 
He's real clear on it. And we should be too. Why do I use this? Why do we dive into this? Because abortion is a picture of our problem. Hang with me here. We're almost done, and I really mean that this time. We are idolaters. We have replaced God's truth with our own perceptions and our own feelings. What do I mean by this? Hang with me. The belief in autonomy is at the core of this. The belief in bodily autonomy of the woman comes from the belief that her body belongs to her and is subject to her rather than that her body belongs to God or to her husband. Let's go ahead and have that one out, by the way. Are you telling me that a woman should, that her body belongs to her husband? No, no, I'm not telling you that. Actually, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 4 tells you that, just so you know. And it's not just the woman's body belongs to her husband, it's the husband's body belongs to his wife. You better believe that there's a sense of mutual relationship going on here. You better believe it's more than just what she wants to do with her body. It's what God says about her body and what her husband says about her body. That's biblical. Boy, that doesn't play well in our culture, does it? We have so become a group of people that want to be popular. We care so much more what the world thinks about us than what God thinks about us. And we need a group of people who don't care about being popular. We care about being godly and holy and following our God even when the world says we're crazy. Bodily autonomy. This is the belief that the woman can do whatever she wants with her body because she can do whatever she wants with her life. And she is at the center of this decision because she is at the center of her life. She sits on the throne of her life. And you know why everyone else supports her in this? It's because they want to sit on the throne of their life. Abortion only became necessary, by the way, after the sexual revolution. And women in churches have bought this lie. Here's a new statistic for you. Women have now, women now have more partners in their life than men do. Partners of a physical nature. We've never had that in the, in the course of human history. Why is that? because they're free to do with their bodies whatever they want. Our women in our churches have bought this lie. The problem with this lie is that you believe God doesn't know what's best for you, and so you go against God. You actually believe that you should choose your own comfort and your career over sacrificing everything to honor God and for that baby. We actually live in a culture that would tell a woman that in order for her to live a life that, is, that, is, that has more money and more comfort, she should destroy that which is the closest thing that she will ever have in her life, and that is a baby. You tell me we're not chasing money and comfort. And we've bought the lie in our churches. So how should we live? I'm going to give you a few things here, and we really are done. We got to focus on the long game rather than the short game. Remember, the cycle. How do we change a culture? Give you three steps. One, focus on God. Stop focusing on the world. The world is selling you lies and deception, that which will destroy you. Stop listening to philosophers that don't have a biblical worldview. Stop listening to preachers that don't preach the Bible. Focus on God. Stop focusing on people. Stop focusing on the world around you. Second, celebrate and propagate the family. This whole, de this whole debate has moved outside of the family. God's ideal is one man, one woman for life. And in that context, they have a whole bunch of babies. And with those babies, you know what they do? 
They live their life to disciple those babies so that those babies become godly men and women. Not so that those babies become rich and powerful and successful so that they can be comfortable. They do whatever they must do with school and activities, all of their time, all of their efforts. They raise those kids so that those kids will be warriors in the army of God. We've abandoned that in our churches. We've handed our kids over to the secularists. We must encourage and strengthen families. And finally, we must make disciples. We need to be disciple-making factories in our homes and in our churches. And listen to me. I want to give you this picture as we close. We must prioritize quality over quantity. This right here is a 2021 McLaren. It's a McLaren speed tail. Why am I using this? I took my, I had last year around this time, I guess, someone clipped me. I took my vehicle to a body shop and at the body shop sitting outside when I pulled in my truck was a McLaren. And I said, what is that? And they said, well, that's a McLaren. Never seen one of those. This is a 2021 McLaren Speedtail. It costs $2.2 million. Only, a, only 106 of these were produced. This right here is a Ram truck. It's actually not mine, but it looks just like mine. The Ram truck currently starts around $30,000. Interesting fact about the Ram truck. It's built in Saltillo, Mexico. It's the second most popular truck. In 2019, which is the year of my truck, this factory in Saltillo, but not the only factory, but this factory rolled out its four millionth Ram truck from its assembly line, which began production in 1995. So understand that, put that in context. That's four million trucks in 24 years, 167,000 each year. What's the difference? If they were giving them away, which one would you take? What's the difference? You see, along the way in the mid-1900s, we bought the lie that we should be all about quality and not about, excuse me, all about quantity and not about quality. So we had the assembly line and we were pumping out, right? We were filling our rooms and we were filling our churches. And what happened was the world said, you know what we're going to do? We're going to focus on changing those who will be teaching, those who will be leading, those who will be reporting. And they focused on quality over quantity. What's the difference? 167,000 a year, 106. Which one are you going to take? You're going to take that McLaren if they're giving them away. Because I drive a Ram truck and I would take that McLaren in a minute. Now here's the good news for us. We don't have to pick between them. But we do have to make disciples. And we do have to invest. Sinclair Ferguson asked this question. Are our churches making disciples who could endure persecution? Are our churches making disciples who can endure persecution? Based on what we've said today, our churches aren't even making disciples who read their Bibles. So no, we're not making disciples who can endure persecution. So here's the question for us. How are we going to make disciples? How are you making disciples? In 1 Corinthians 9, Paul gives the mission statement of his ministry. He says, though I'm free and belong to no man, I make myself a slave to all men so that by all possible means I might win some. He uses the word to win four times there in three verses. And then in verse 22, he says it again, but he says it in a different way, to save some. So what's his life about? Winning souls, saving souls. And he goes on, he says, I do not fight like a man beating the air, I do not run without purpose. I live my life with purpose, and that is to see souls saved. That's your purpose. 
to be salt and light and to see souls saved. And God's called us to win the many. He's called us to that. He's called you to that. You know the hardest thing about leaving here and transitioning to where God called me to? The hardest thing, listen to me. The hardest thing about leaving this church is there are people coming to this church that came here because of me. I don't say that arrogantly. I say that because I, I want you to take a step with me. There are a whole lot of people that are leaving churches and going to other churches, aren't there? I just have a sense that if there were people in that church body that were there because of them, it would be a whole lot harder for them to leave that church. So what's my point? Before you leave today, I want you to look around. I want you to ask yourself this question. Who is here today because I'm here? Not me, you. Ask this question. Who is in this room and attending this church because you are here? Who did you win? Who's saved because of you? And who's growing in their walk because of you? And if you don't have an individual... If we don't have those individuals, we're the problem. We're the problem. Make disciples. You. You. It's not about the next guy who's going to stand up here. It's about you being who God's called you to be. Salt and light and winning souls. We're in a dark place, but we've got the light. We're in a decaying world, but we've got the salt. So make disciples. Do what God has called us to do, brothers and sisters. Salt, light, winning souls. God, we pray in Jesus' name that you would light us up, that you would set us loose, that we would honor and please you with our lives. God, I pray in Jesus' name that every person in this room right now who is a follower of you, who has been saved, they've been born again, I pray, God, that you would speak to them and call them to live as salt, to live as light, and to win souls. And I pray that every single person in this room, this time next year, this next year of July 4th, 2023, that they can look around this room and see people that are here because they're here. Because they've won them, Lord. God, we need you to do that in us and for us. And Lord, I pray for the person who's here today who doesn't know you. They've never been saved. They've never been born again. They've never been changed. Save them, change them today. If you're here today and you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ and you have ingested the doctrines and the philosophies of this world, you are living in darkness and your life is decaying right before you, I encourage and invite you to call out to Jesus right now. Ask him to forgive you of your sins and give you new life. Right now, call out to Jesus. Ask him to forgive you of your sins and give you new life. And for every single person in this room, that we would live as salt and light and win souls. God, you've heard our prayer You've heard our cries. Make application to our lives. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.